the, direct, the creative director of the New York Times live conversation and performance series, Times Talks, which pairs New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest names from the fields of film, theater, science, art, fashion, literature, and of course, music. Before I introduce tonight's talent, I'd like to give a special thanks to our sponsor, Cultural Council of Palm Beach County, who now have a brief video message we'd like to share with you all. Now the moment we've all been waiting for, here to announce the winner of the getaway to the Palm Beaches sweepstakes is Angelique Allen of the Cultural Council. Here she comes. <laughs> Good evening. Yay. Thank you to those of you who participated in our contest tonight. Just a reminder, uh, you must be present to win, and I have um, the name of our winner tonight, uh, the lucky winner, and I apologize if I mispronounce this, is John Liparache. John, are you here? John, come Yay, on up. Come on. <laughs> what did they win? Uh, so John is winning a round-trip airfare for two, a three-night hotel stay, um, and a $250 cultural voucher to visit the Palm Beaches, Florida. Congratulations, John. Wow. Congratulations. All right. We're we'll doing a quick photo. Quick photo. We're yeah. doing a photo. Come oh, on. Yeah, quick photo. Really sure. quick. Smile, John. <laughs> hey. Congratulations. Okay, on with the program. I'm now delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with Grammy Award-winning multi-platinum selling artists Ben Harper and Charlie Musselwhite, who have teamed up once again on their new album, No Mercy in This Land, releasing on March 30th. Following tonight's conversation is a live musical performance that expresses the kinship between Ben and Charlie as they recount personal stories that undeniably add to the sonic history of American struggle and survival. Moderating tonight's conversation is Ben Cesario, who covers music for the New York Times. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Ben Cesario, Charlie Musselwhite, and Ben Harper. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, let me just say, how cool is it that we have Ben Harper and Charlie Musselwhite, and they're going to play music for us. But first, some questions. Um, so you're about to release your second album together, guys. Your last one, Get Up, won a Grammy Award. Best blues album, <laughs> four years ago. Um, could you just talk about the origins of this project and of the two of you working together? Please. Well, uh, we first met in 1993. Um, ben was opening for John Lee Hooker at a club called the Sweetwater in Mill Valley, California. And uh, John had invited me to play with him, which he often did. And that's where we first met. And then not too long after that, John had us back him up in the studio to record. And uh, we really locked in in the studio. And uh, even John Lee at the end of the session said, man, you guys got to make more music together. You guys are great together. You know? And we talked about that for years and years. <laughs> but the problem was we never had the time. We were always passing each other in airports or festivals or something, and kept talking about it. Finally, we got it. The time came and we went in and man, the music just was pouring out of us like it had been pent up all this time. And we let it escape <laughs> into the world. So after all that time, what was it that finally actually got you to make the record? <laughs> the songs were there and um, on my part, the hero worship was there because I'd grown up listening to, sorry, but I gotta let it loose though. So. <laughs> I'd grown up on Charlie's music, and 
it felt like it felt like um, the it felt like Charlie was my north star for the songs that I, I, I write and the music that I love the most. I mean, was that something that was like in your wish list or your back pocket all these years? Like, you know what? I'm actually John Lee Hooker told us to make a record. We have to do it. Yeah, at some John point. didn't waste words at all. So when he made a mention of something, you do right to take note. So 25 years ago, you guys first met. You, now you made two records together. What's the chemistry like between you, the two of you at this point when you're making music? Kindred souls. Yeah. <laughs> we're on the same path. And uh, so we're able to work together easily because we can see what we're looking at and it makes sense. Nothing has to be explained. We already got it. So we just do it. Talk about the new record. Um, the first one was such a success. Um, was it just do it again? You know, take another, take another ride on the train? Or was there work that you still wanted to do? Another ride on the train. <laughs> what, I, <laughs> what train? No, no I, I uh, yeah, right. Um, I would say, I would say that um, I personally, I knew that Get Up had just scratched the surface, and so even in my heart of hearts, after Get Up and after we had been running it down the road, hundred thousand miles or so, I went, okay, I see where this can go possibly, if given the chance um, by people who, who press play. So thank you for doing that. Did you have a particular goal in mind about the new record? Um, my, yeah. For some reason, I was able to get that. Oh, my, check two. Yeah. Check. <laughs> I think making a record with any other goal in mind other than bringing out the best in the songs uh, is risky. Um, of course, you want all your music to do well. Everybody wants their music to, to succeed out in the public. But for me, first and foremost was bringing out the best in the songs with the right musicians in the room and constantly eating good food. <laughs> it's just there's no a session that is where you're poorly fed. Oh. No record, no great music has been made without proper feeding. And it's funny because musicians, grown ass men, arrive at the studio hungry. It's like we get to the studio, you think, you know, you eat and then go to work. No, musicians go to work and expect to be fed. It's a whole, that's a whole other thing. Okay, so what kind of cuisine fed <laughs> this record? We had a lot of Thai food. We, we got a, Charlie and I have, a, I, I actually, because Charlie is a southern gentleman at heart, if that's fair for me to say. Wow. And uh, I introduced Charlie to a rib spot where the, where the food just, meat just fell off the bone. Oh, yeah. And Charlie was like, okay, all right. I trust you a little bit more when you show me this. <laughs> so you pick up the bone and the meat's still laying there. <laughs> Take the meat. <laughs> that sounds like a blues meal to me. That's Okay, let's talk about the, the record. Um, some of the themes of the music as I, was, as I was listening to it, you have some struggles with addiction on there. You have a song called The Bottle Wins Again. Sure. Um, you wanna talk about that one, Ben? I mean, I'll, 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 I'll start, I'll hit it just by saying, yeah, I've a lot of years on the road, a lot of miles behind me, and um, we build up a resistance to all kinds of things, some good, some bad. And uh, I found that socially acceptable drinking borders on, if not is, alcoholism mm -hmm. after a certain point. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was time for a, a real shift. And I haven't had a drink um, in going on one year, just in about a year. And I don't plan on going back. It's funny because the people who I say that, oh, yo, you're going back. Come on, on your year anniversary. Like, That's the worst time to go back. Like, <laughs> I made it a year. Cheers. 
Was sure. this song, where was it in that process of overcoming it? Was it you sort of wishing to end or celebrating the end? Um, How honest are we gonna get here? It's up to you. <laughs> All right, fair enough. I, it took me writing the song to see the problem. Uh, yeah. And it, it took me writing the song to actually take a good look um, at a lot of things that could be behind uh, what, was, what the pull was. Because at the end of the day, it's just a taste, right? I mean, it's a mood-altering situation, too, but it's also, I mean, yeah, so we were in the studio. Henry, is it all right, Henrietta, if I call you out on this, because this is a family affair. Charlie's wife, uh, w the song was <coughs> flying out of the speakers, and it was feeling good, and everybody was real happy with the way it was coming out. And kind of surprised, I think this record jumped up and bit us in a way because it, you kind of don't know you're gonna exceed your own expectations till you do, right? Then you went, oh, okay, cool. Um, and the song was feeling good and everybody was high-fiving and happy and Charlie's wife, Henry, just pronounced with no real, um, with no, no target or purpose, just, I don't think, it didn't feel like it, because it felt very non-judgmental. She goes, you know, wow, what a song. She goes, that song was written by an alcoholic. <laughs> she and had went, experience with one. Yeah, and I, I yeah. went, yeah, I went, <laughs> no, but, yeah. And she, yeah, it was, yeah. Charlie, do you want to talk about that? Um, you have your own experience with, with this same situation, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Many people today still don't believe I've quit. They just can't imagine me not drinking. Well, it's been 30 years. Oh. Piece of cake. <laughs> Did you think of that song as sort of something that, uh, about something that the two of you shared? Did you... Um, feel that as you were uh, writing sure. and recording it? Yeah. Sure. I, um, anything that pops up as alcoholic in nature, I'm familiar with it. And, uh, <laughs> mostly I'm, I like to run into people that are looking for advice because they heard that I quit and they want to know, how did you do that? Well, I, I wanted the same thing before I figured it out. So I'm always there to help people, give them advice. Did you talk and to Ben? Ben too. I just asked if you uh, if you helped Ben as well. Did I help Ben with alcohol? Mm -hmm. No, no, he helped himself pretty well. <laughs> Didn't need help from me. In the drinking process or the quitting process? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I was an example because I had quit, and so you saw that you were maybe for sure. it was. It could you be and Henrietta done. were a huge example, yeah. and and led as such. You know, to to he never came down heavy, and it's you know, I mean. I've got kids and child support and shit, so I can't really tell y'all. I'm not confessing to have been that, <laughs> just in case, you know. I'm, try I'm not trying to get a call from my ex's lawyers and shit, taking my kids away. So I'm not confessing to a damn thing. You know, as far as I'm concerned, none of this shit is autobiographical. <laughs> right? Let's just get clear on that. For the record, you know, my dad was the one with the drinking problem. It's about him. Yeah. It's about him. It ain't about <laughs> me, but I haven't had a drink in a year, and that's the most important part. That's right. Congratulations. Mortality, life and death is another theme that threads throughout these songs um, repeatedly. Um, when I go is one song, Trust You to Dig My Grave is another, and the, the title track, um, No Mercy in This Land, has some of those ideas in there. Ben, you're, you're still a young man. Um, what, are you, what were you thinking about when you were writing those, those songs on this record? Am I talking too much? Because Charlie, I don't want you sitting here like, man, you know. No, I'm, I'm right. doing good. I'm enjoying everything. Me too, all right. I'm not trying to be that guy. But uh, I wrestled with it, 
you know, mortality as we all do in our own ways, and it, it's, it's trying to make sense out of the inevitable. Um, and there's a certain unfairness to that reality, but look at all we get in between that hopefully balances it out. And maybe, who knows, we'll step onto something bigger and brighter. Is the blues, you know, uniquely good about addressing those basic questions, life and death? Sure. <laughs> uh, I always say that blues is your comforter when you're down, and it's your buddy when you're up. So it's always there for you. If, you're, if your life is great and you're partying, it's there. If you hit a bad bump in the road and things look bleak, it's there to help you get through it. Because the blues has a spirit about never giving up, keep it on going, we can do it, we can get through it, no matter how tough it is. And uh, that's true. But it's also that it, you know, death is always around the corner. That's and, life. And, right. And blues is life. Yeah. 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 Um, Charlie, the title track of this song, or the, of the album, uh, No Mercy in This Land, um, this addresses something very personal for you, um, your mother's murder. Um, can you tell us what happened? In 90, no, in 2005, she was 93, and um, still driving her car and working in her garden and had all kind of opinions and <laughs> attitudes and... Uh, she was fully functioning, you know, at 93. And a guy uh, kicked in her back door and came in and strangled her. To, uh, it was close to Christmas time and he wanted some extra cash, so he took her little Casio keyboard and some, her TV and hocked them. And that's how they caught him. He went to the nearest place to, from her house and they uh, were able to run him down. So that's what happened. Was it difficult to uh, sing a song on this record that um, at least part of it is explicitly about that? Well, when this happened, uh, I was sober. But man, right away, my brain, this good friend of mine that's on my side, supposedly starts screaming at me, you got to have a drink. You gotta have a drink right now. You can't handle this. And I'm saying, shut up. I'm doing just fine. Yes, no, you need a drink. No, shut up. This goes back and forth. I didn't ever have a drink, but it's odd how your brain will turn on you like that. It was a test. It's like a separate voice that won't shut up when you tell it to. Anyhow, so I deal with it and I get all the way through it. And now, uh, with this song, it's, I have this feeling like I don't want to keep it all buried down in my chest and tamped down and because if it's buried, it'll just fester and uh, it'll come out in negative ways or something. So on the other hand, I don't want to wear it on my sleeve and hold up signs or something about what I've been through. So a song and a beautiful song and a wonderful song like this with these great lyrics allows me to talk about it in a way that puts the sunshine on it and makes it okay. It's what blues is supposed to do. It's a healer. That's what John Lee Hooker said. Ben, you wrote the song. Yeah. Um, tell us about writing that song and um, how much were you thinking about Charlie as you wrote it? 100%. And that was, it was a, uh, a big moment personally, Charlie and I's relationship, for me to present that song to him. Um, and I was nervous, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I was, it was, hey, I, I, almost, I almost said, hey, I wrote this song and I was hoping you'd sing it or we could sing it together. You can you know, sing whichever part of it you feel, you know, that, that would be, you know, I, I just, just kind of laid it at his feet uh, reverentially in hopes that it would it wouldn't be overstepping my my over crossing a line I shouldn't and he just he leaned into it and I was like Phew. <laughs> because um, yeah that could I mean 
where do I get off, you know, writing, being somebody's biographer, really. So uh, thank you for letting me. We're kindred souls. It's, it's all good. Thank you. That Allow seems to me. say something about your relationship together that, you know, that you can sort of, I mean, that's such an intimate and difficult uh, topic in a song. Yeah. Um, that you can, you know, write for each other. And it took it took the making of Get Up, and that and so when you say you no, know, you know, maybe why do another record or how do you come to another record? Well, it's through the making of Get Up and those million miles on the road and those you know couple few hundred shows that we did that we grew together not only as musicians but as friends and as comrades that led to me being confident enough to to write that song with Charlie and heart and mind and, and bring it to him um, without having to duck. Can I ask a question of, of each of you? How did you first encounter blues music? Do you remember or was it always there? Uh, growing up in Memphis, it was just seemed like it was part of the environment. Just. There was all kind of music going on, uh, rockabilly and hillbilly and gospel and pop and jazz. But blues sounded to me, the way it sounded, it was like, that's how I feel. So it was, uh, it made me feel good. Especially if I was down, it lifted me up. Kind of put its arms around me and said, it's gonna be okay. So as a little kid, that was good for me. And it got me uh, focused on that music. I didn't know it was leading anywhere. It just I just loved the music. And I made a point to get to know all the real old time blues singers around Memphis and hung out with them and learned tunes and stuff, which later on <laughs> became a career. If I'd known at the time, I'd have paid a lot more attention to these guys. <laughs> I just thought I was having fun with a hobby or something. When did it, you realize that it was, you know, your, your, your career, your calling? Uh, when we made this last album. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <clears throat> that long. Well, there were other indications <laughs> along the way. Uh, when, when I got up to Chicago, I wasn't going around asking if I could sit in or hold up my harmonica and point to it. Or, I didn't even tell anybody I played. I was just happy to be hanging out and listening to Muddy Waters or Little Walter or Sonny Boy or Howlin' Wolf till four in the morning. And I, and I already knew how to drink, so <laughs> I fit right in, you know. I was one of the guys. Uh, but a waitress that got to know me real well told Muddy, oh, you ought to hear Charlie play harmonica. And Muddy's like, Charlie plays harmonica? He just thought I was a fan. So next thing I know, he's calling me up to sit in. Well, that changed everything. Because then people started offering me money to play with them. And that, boy, that got my attention. <laughs> yeah. That was my ticket out of the factory. Uh, how about you, Ben? I got nothing on that, man. That's what's <laughs> happening right there. I mean. Well, you grew up around all kinds of music um, with your family, Yeah. right? Yeah. When did the blues sort of come into focus as the thing for the you? The blues personally hit me before there was a note because my childhood was wrought with challenge left and right. I mean, it was, it was, it was turmoil from the jump, right, till we got up out of there. I thought my mom was mad enough to divorce my dad. You should have seen her when we came back in the house and it was safe and the records were gone. My <laughs> pops took all mom's records. That's when she really got pissed. <laughs> yeah. Neither here nor there just to say so. That the, there was already something that I, ha I was going to have to work out for the rest of my life real quick, right? So when I heard blues, it resonated with my pain. Mm -hmm. And that's, I'm still trying to work it out to, I mean, you know, yeah. I'm the only one whose therapist fired him. <laughs> it, was, it was hard work. I mean, look, man, we're trying to make sense out of this. Some, you know, you see all this, the madness. It's like, man, did I, did I get up on the wrong planet? Because this is not making sense here. But it's cool. I'm with it. 
in a few minutes, we're going to um, take questions. So think about it. Think of some good questions. Um, I'm going to get in a couple more before that, though. Um, does the music industry put you in a box if you play blues? Um, do you do you have to deal with the impression that it's kind of an old type of music ever? Sure. I mean, a lot of people are under the impression that it's, uh, some people think it was like a fad, it comes and goes. It's not, blues is not like that. It's like a philosophy or something, a way to look at life. So it goes up and down, but it, it ain't going to go away. But the way we're doing it now, the, the main thing is to play blues is the feeling. You can play all the notes and the chords, but if it doesn't have the feeling, they don't make it blues. The feeling is what makes it blues. So with this album, it's got the feeling, we brought it forward, and now it's in a, a new package, brand new 21st century up to day blues. Current, not a rehash of what Howlin' Wolf did or something, which is okay, but we're moving ahead. Isn't that kind of close? <laughs> that's, that's it. And also, just to just to you know, if uh, to go on the, along those lines, all music and all musicians are put in a box till you work your ass off to break out of that box and prove everyone wrong who says <laughs> you don't deserve to be where you are. Mm -hmm. That's it. Blues and otherwise. Yeah. Duke Ellington said there's only two kinds of music, good music and bad music. <laughs> um, and I'm both. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another blues question. Um, I'd like to read a quote from John Lennon. He said, the blues is a chair, not a design for a chair or a better chair. It is the first chair. It is a chair for sitting on, not chairs for looking at or being appreciated. You sit on that music. Do you agree? Do you ever think of it in that way? Well, I never have before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's a nice way of putting it. That's not how I would have put it, but it's, it's OK. What about like a foundation? Do you ever think of it that way as kind of the thing that you stand on or rest on? Yeah, it's got a, a heavy bottom to it. I mean, with in many ways in its history and in the feeling and everything. So, I mean, it's like, if you want to use the word infected or all many styles of music, people will be playing and you hear them doing blues licks and pop and country and all kind of rock tunes. I mean, blues is filtered all into everything, just about. I don't think you hear it in classical, maybe, but uh, it's a huge influence. What do you think, Ben? I like that quote. I think. I think. I think. Uh, I think he. I think. I, I hear what he's. I, like when you when you press play on on your blues. That's blues, man. Like I, I I'm feeling that. I think we're uh, almost. And you may see the first and last time I ever disagree with Charlie. Because <laughs> I don't disagree. I mean, I know what he's saying, and, but I mean, yeah, it's. Yeah. Um, I think we are uh, close to the point where we can take questions. So there are microphones um, in, in, the, in the aisle. Um, please uh, step up and uh, uh, feel free to ask a question. We have a few that have come in from Facebook. so. I'm going to start with, uh, OK, sir? How, ben, how scary was it the first time you met Duke Clinton? <laughs> he was so good to me um, that it wasn't scary at all. He made it di completely disarming. And I saw Black Sunday after I met him. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to ask. Uh, this is a question from Nicole on Facebook, who's watching. 
Um, she says, what have you learned from each other during this process? Hmm. Touring with Ben, I've learned that touring can be better than how I do it. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of fun going down the road. And I'd say I, I learned from Charlie um, the sacred art of soloing. And I, I Charlie, Charlie's soloing for me is, is I, I try to, he just taught me a lot as far as solo method, the method of soloing on an instrument and to be a soloist and what that means. I mean, listening to the record, that is one of the things that just jumps out is, you know, yeah. it's like a bird taking off. You hear Charlie playing a solo. Hmm. Um, really, it's wonderful. So I hope you all get to hear it soon. Um, how about a question over here? Sure. Uh, evening, Charlie. Evening, Ben. Uh, Good evening. Thanks for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for doing this. Um, I saw you guys in Irving Plaza when you released the first album, and mm -hmm. seriously, one of the greatest musical experiences of my <laughs> life. When you sang All That Matters Now, it just really sang my blues, so I want to thank you for that, first of all. Um, Thanks for feeling it for your heart and ears. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, second, I wanted to know how you approach writing music differently with Charlie than you would with some of the other musicians that you've worked with. You've worked with so many other musicians. Charlie makes the, the songs I write true blue. Not that I don't have my own true blue, but Charlie takes them and, and paints them deep, deep blue, bluer than they could ever get, and bluer than I would even present. I wouldn't present this music without Charlie. It, it needs, it, it's, he's the reason I write and make blues music today. Oh, thanks, and it really comes through in the music too, so thank right you guys. On. Thanks for, and thanks for checking that show. That was a big show for us. That, 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 Irving Plaza show indicated yeah. where the music could go, didn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. How about a question over here? Sure. Good, good question. Um, hi, gentlemen. Ben, I've been listening hey. to you for almost 20 years. Thank so this you. is a very cool moment. Uh, um, I'm me. curious who your favorite partners are to collaborate with, present company excluded, uh, if you would uh, explain why as well. Oh, that is so, I love that question too because it, it tightens the screws and I can't, I can't name them without leaving a boatload <laughs> off. Um, pick, pick like your top three. Oh, maybe. you're gonna give me three? That's, yeah. the, that's yeah. legit. No, no, thank you because that, no, I, seriously. I know, I mean you played with your mom, like she's gotta be up there, I hope, maybe. But, <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite show was you and your mom in San Francisco a few years ago, so. My poor mom, man, because we, were, we got the Grammy and I walked out to thank somebody and I froze up and died. Charlie goes, your mom! I'm like, oh, my mom, you can even hear it. I was like, oh man, she's put up with a lot. Um, so, present company and family excluded because Charlie is family. Um, I would say Natalie Maines. She is the daughter of one of the finest living steel guitar players, Lloyd Maines. And she taught me as much about steel guitar and slide guitar as anyone ever has. Uh, and and that just from growing up immersed in it. So I'd say Natalie, um, I'd say Ringo Starr, because he set a bar for me. He just say, hey man, you know, as far as the way he works and what he expected of me was more than anyone had ever expected of me to that point. And living into that, you know, I had to, I had to uh, get my, I had to get my personal best every time I hit the stage with him. Um, and then three, Taj Mahal. Yeah. Yeah. Taj Mahal gave me my first break, and he saw something in me that didn't exist until he saw it in me. And funny story, he came up to me after he saw me play when I was 20 or 21, and he said, "Hey, uh, hey, youngster." Do, do, do you go on the road? <laughs> and, I, I was, and I was so green. I said, on the road when I drive? You mean I drive on the road? <laughs> and he said, no, man, come on, do your tour. And I said, well, I've, 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 I went busking in Europe. You know, he said, oh, man, you are so green. He said, when you get a ticket in the mail, 
get on the plane. And I didn't even know what he, I thought he was, and then I got a ticket and a note from Taj saying, learn these, you know, 50 Taj Mahal songs and get on the plane. Without Taj, I might not be here. Haven't forgotten about you, Charlie. Oh, well, same question. I can't really remember collaborating with anybody other than uh, Eliana Sochoa. Oh, well, Tom Waits I uh, rec recorded with many times. I don't think we like, actually collaborated. I just oh, okay. played on his record. But Eliada Sochoa, if you don't know who he was, he was the guy with the big white cowboy hat in the Buena Vista Social Club thing. And uh, he lives in Santiago de Cuba and plays traditional Cuban song. And I'm a big fan of his. And uh, I had this idea of us playing together, of him playing like blues chord changes with the Cuban rhythm, but that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I was playing these tunes for Eliotis, and he's, his eyes just glazed over. <laughs> I thought, mm, this ain't gonna work. So I said, listen, man, I know all your tunes. So I'm gonna do your tunes, and I'm gonna put blues lyrics to them. And uh, with, if, you, if you approve of them, you know, we'll do it that way. And he liked what I came up with, and so uh, it was his music with my lyrics and, and that whole sewn way of playing that really, I, I find really exciting. And blues and sewn work together. Uh, I did, we did an album called Continental Drifter. And uh, so it was a blend of traditional Cuban music and blues. And it was really good, I thought. Interesting territory to uh, explore. I like to mess around. <laughs> <laughs> I like to see where you can put blues into another situation and make it better. I did it with Cindy, too, Cindy Lauper. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. How about a question over here? Yes, good evening. Great to uh, be here with you, Charlie mm -hmm. and Ben. Just had a question, uh, speaking of drummers and Ringo Starr, what, what type of drummers do you gravitate to these days for touring and accompaniment? What do you look for? Is it, is it timekeeping? Is it uh, foundation? Is it uh, fills? Uh, j just curious, what, what type of drummer do you, do you look for these days? I don't know about all that technical stuff. I just know <laughs> when the guy's playing behind me is a feel. And he makes me play better than ordinarily. And he kind of lifts me up. He's like wind in my sails. He's, then I know that's a good drummer. Now, how he does that and what's the words for to explain it, I don't know. But I can feel it and I know that's the guy I want. <laughs> Other guys, it feel like you're pulling them. Come on, man. Put, you know, push me. Don't make me pull you. You don't want that guy. And mine would be uh, feel, risk taking, um, time, the timing. The timing is for me not as important as, as feel and risk taking. And then the fourth would have to be personality, because man, if you don't have that, you'll be the first one kicked off the, <laughs> off the road. <laughs> Great insight, gentlemen. Thanks so much. Thanks for your question. Hey, you a drummer? You got to be a drummer. All right. Yeah. Man. <laughs> How about over here? Hi, guys. Thank hey. you for being here tonight. Thank you for being, for being here. <laughs> ben, this question's for you. Um, in 2003, you spoke at my commencement at Claremont High School. Hey, what's hey. that? What's up? <laughs> yeah, man, I, I, I don't get invited to do that often. I mean, ain't nobody giving me an honorary degree, and nobody's no. asking me to talk at <laughs> shit. So I rem it stands out when I got to do that. Thank you. Well, you did a phenomenal job, first of all. Thank and you. the message that you gave that day still stayed with me 15 years later. Come do you on. remember what it was? Come on. <laughs> Tell me. You said. <laughs> <laughs> so you said, look, as you get older, you're always going to be tempted by more and more and more. So remember. Don't get consumed by the material things. Focus on doing what you love. Right on. Right on to you. Right on. No, that's that. I remember it now. I do. So my question is, 15 years later, yeah. 
Would you still give the same advice to class of 2018? I would. Don't be consumed by consumption. Nothing yeah. else you would add? Oh, what would I add? Um, don't vote Republican? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, that, that reminds me of, of something I, I, I wanted to ask. The, the song No Mercy in This Land, the title track of the record, yeah. um, it's, it's a very personal song. But knowing your history, Ben, I wondered if there is some um, comment about our times in our country um, woven in there? Is yeah, that, that, can play, right? that can play to, to different sentiments for sure. I hope it can, if, if people let it. Again, because I can't, you, you put it out and you, you know, when you hear it and people who know me, you know it, you know what I'm saying. You, you, you know, so it's, 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 a, it's a clear shot. Um, but I hate to say where I want it to land. I just hope it can, you know, if, Songs can play different ways for different reasons, and I, some of the songs I've embraced the most, that, not my own, other people's, can play to different emotions and different different uh, definitions. Uh, how about over here? Okay, hi. Thanks so much for coming to New York. Um, my I'm question, so relieved there's questions too, because there's nothing where you go, you, like we're up here talking and nobody's like, oh, we ain't got nothing to ask them. Mom. <laughs> my question is more geared towards Ben. Um, I've been blessed to witness a lot of your collaborations with musicians over the Thank years. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And um, as a creative person, I'm always quite inspired that um, you make it work with not one person, but like, you know, all the people that you collaborate with. It's Thank very you. inspiring. So, my question is uh, towards that creative process and sort of how you manifest that when you sit down and write. Is it, are you? kind of thinking about who that might fit with, or is it just kind of coming along and then those things kind of piece together yeah. later on? Yeah, you know, sometimes you can write with someone in mind and someone, you know, I, there's a song on this record called Love and Trust, we're gonna play it tonight, that I originally wrote from Mavis Staples. I got a, cattle, I got a call um, to, uh, from Mavis Camp saying she's looking for original material for her, and I went, oh man, well, first of all, of I'm like, oh man, who else did they call? I'm like, okay. You know, because you know they're calling all the heavies. It's Mavis Staples. And I'm like, all right, cool. I sat down, Mavis in my mind's eye, and I felt like she was in the room and wrote the song Love and Trust uh, and presented it to her. She said, yes. I was like, oh. And so um, that you can, you can do that with someone in mind. You can also, some you cobble together over time. But as far as being, uh, working with other people, uh, hopefully seamlessly, you know, listen, I have clear, when I, if I'm gonna work with someone, I'm gonna give it every single thing. I take it as seriously as if it was my own record. If I'm producing, if I'm writing a song, I write it with the same passion as if it's gonna be for me. Um, and most important, I, if it's production or even working in any collective, I work from the smartest idea in the room I don't have the best ideas. I don't have the right ideas. I have my ideas and I apply them. And it's, I love it when I have a great idea and someone in the room makes it even better. And so it, it, I just, it, I, I remove the ego. Because ego has been, you know, they have so many programs as we've discussed. Oh, oh see, look. <laughs> <laughs> so many programs for recovering addicts but there's no programs for recovering assholes. <laughs> you know? And I think that we, we've got we've to get the, you know, so that's an important program that I am enlisted in. And it, it's been ego that has been the cause of that. So I just remove all that and, and mm -hmm. say, you know, it's, it's, it's been the best time in my life creatively. And the fact that I would arrive here with the greatest blues musician one of the greatest blues musicians of all time. Ego free is my good fortune. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Well, thank you so much for your and sharing your creative process. The thank first time I saw you was I'm opening for Pearl Jam in '96. So thank you for the journey. <laughs> mm -hmm.
Um, I just want to say we're getting close to the point where we're going to have some music. Um, so we have time, I think, for one quick question. There's a gentleman over there. I uh, just want to say it, it's really an honor to, to uh, be here with you guys. Love the first album. Why are you making us wait until the end of March for the second one? <laughs> uh, that's not really my question. Uh, re release it tomorrow, please. Um, no, really, my question is, um, a song from the first album, I Ride at Dawn, always hits me right here, always brings us here. Thank you so here. much for hearing that. Every time I hear it, and uh, I just wanted to ask about the inspiration for that song. The inspiration was um, a friend of mine, his brother was a Navy SEAL, and he was killed in the line of duty, and the brother had thoughts of becoming a seal. He, he, has this, he has that inner divine strength that it would take. But he's also a musician, and he chose music. And to afford the guitar of his dreams, um, they were able to sell his sniper rifle for the guitar that has set him on his musical course. And I wrote that song for his brother. Wow. Thank you for hearing that. Thank you. Um, got a real quick one? I can make it quick. Okay. <laughs> I'm an alcoholic, my name's Steve, and I, uh, I just want to say congratulations, Ben, for the uh, for the year sober. Any day hey. sober is just hey, man. You know, it's the no, best thing on. that you know, brother. Sorry for the loss of your mother. I'm so sorry. And uh, don't go to school with your daughter. She lay left to tell, give her my love, please. And uh, this is an invitation this to both of you. Easy. This is Man? yes, it is for you. And uh, this is for Charlie. I'll this let is you a, yeah. It's an invitation. I'm in the process of creating a global spirit festival. And everything you sat here and talked about is family friendly, sober festival. Right? And you said, the reason I got up at the microphone is because you said taking risks. Okay, I was going to try to connect with you because I see you playing at it. I talked to Naco Bear. I talked to, I work with indigenous people in North and South America. And uh, the idea is to take the wisdom of the ancestors, the wisdom of, of our elders and our youth, because there's a lot of wisdom in the youth, to bring them forward and let them know so we can glean the information from them and also so we can hear what the children need. When they, when they get to the decision-making process where we're at, you know? And uh, this is an invitation for everybody, you know? It's like, it's a global spirit festival. So where's take that? those. Where? It's gonna be somewhere within 100 miles of New York City, oh, right. you know? It's like, it's, <laughs> I haven't, don't have the location, but I do want to I know when it is. It's, in, it's Memorial Day weekend in 2019. And the whole concept is to remember who we are. That's the shit. All right? So Thank I have information. Here. Thank you, sir. I just want to give this to you. Yeah. You take the time to use that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, on that note, I think it's time for music. So uh, let's welcome Ben and Charlie in the band. Thank you.
You can lie awake at night, pretend not to see. But you can't put that apple back up on his tree. There ain't no worries. You can't drink away. I trust you. Trust you to dig my grave. Woke up this morning for the cup of the blues. I will always find a way to lose. Give me one reason. Reason I should stay. Ah, oh, and I trust you. I trust you to dig my grave. Spend your whole life with one woman dying. Leave her your farm. The very next day she on your best friend's arm. There ain't no worries. You can't drink away. I trust you. Trust you to dig my grave. I walk, but I stumble. Roll, but I tumble. Reach, but I fumble. Speak, but I mumble. Coming and going a hundred different ways. I trust you. Trust you to dig my. Don't wanna be your first lover, just wanna be your last. If you promise not to tell, I promise I won't ask. You can't drink away. Oh, I trust you, I trust you to dig my grave. Oh, and I trust you, mm, I trust you, I trust you to. It is meant as a love song. <laughs> this one? No, uh, trust you to dig my grave. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Cause if That's you, true love. And right? Because yeah. if you trust somebody with that, you trust you. you it takes love. Yeah, man. You want to end up three feet. <laughs> <laughs> like, ah, uh, you know, that's enough digging. What 
would be the first thing you'd say to the Lord. The last thing you would dream if you couldn't dream no more. Won't you please help me understand? Is there no mercy in this land? No mercy in this land. Followed the river till the river ran dry. Followed my lover till we said goodbye. Followed you through soldiers who fired on command. Is there no mercy in this land? Travel only to and from. Come close, you'll see the red of a well bitten tongue. The righteous and the wretched, the holy and the damned. Is there no mercy in this land? No mercy in this land. Father left us down here all alone. My poor mother lies under a stone with an aching heart and trembling hands. Is there no mercy in this land? On the drums, Jimmy Paxson. <laughs> On guitar, Jason Mazursky. <laughs> Travis, Daria, and Keisha.
the simplest things can be the hardest to do can't find what you're looking for even when it's looking for you the judge and the criminal sinner and the priest they got something in common bring them all to their knees do what you can do what you must when you're out there trying to find your love and trust i walk the line i walk it for us you see me out here looking for my love and trust Lust ain't nothing but stealing from a thief. Storm after storm leaves you shaking like a leaf. They say broken hearts make the world go round. We're trading headaches for heartbreaks, gonna get you down. Got to give it some time. Don't try to rush when you're looking for your love and trust do what you can might not be enough everybody's got to have some love and trust in a race that doesn't want to run an executioner who won't fire his gun like a boxer that won't take a swing then like a prince who don't want to be a king haven't we suffered suffered enough now we're out here fighting about some love might not be enough everybody's got to have their love and trust love and trust love and trust made on Long Island, by the way. I slip Long Island to be exact. Very unworthy of that instrument. I, I, I'm not, uh, it's true. Other people will tell you so, but uh, they'll have to get over it. Yeah.
On the kindness of strangers, I've come to depend. For a shoulder to lean or hand in them. This world's too hard to not have someone to break my fall. sins for which one just cannot atone. What if we end 
just where we begin. Everywhere we go, we have already been. Would you relive the pain, or would you call it wrong? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. All gone for nothing at all. Ben Harper, Charlie Muscle White. Thank you.